All right, team, welcome back to After Hours. We have a lot of great topics today coming off a crazy weekend here in America with former President Donald Trump getting shot in the ear. And Maddie and I were discussing it before the show here and how crazy it is and just the crazy times we're living here in here, team. And so today we're going to discuss a little bit about Donald Trump, but more about what he had to say about CBDCs early last week. We're also going to discuss, are we on the brink of a bull run? A lot of indicators showing us that we're about to do that blow off top. We're about to see $80,000 Bitcoin. And so we're going to get into that. Also, Algorand and Hedera evaluated by Sweden's central bank. Very interesting there. And all of these topics we will discuss here, team. But before we get going here, Bitcoin is just at an interesting price right now. I've seen people like Wrecked Capital make the argument we are two months away from this big blow off top, you know, and we don't want to take things that have happened previously and shove it into a box of this year and be like, okay, we're going to see a blow off top in Bitcoin this September or this October, you know, because things change. Black Swan events, you know, various factors take place, you know, and you just can't pinpoint it to one month or one day. And so this is why, team, you must be strategic right now, more strategic than any other point you've had to be in right now. Because if you have a portfolio, a crypto portfolio, you're at an interesting predicament right now. If you were in the bear market, dollar cost averaging and setting limit orders and yada, yada, yada with us doing all that fun stuff, you're feeling pretty great right now. Our portfolios are feeling pretty great, feeling lar at large right now, looking at my coin stats and looking at my altcoins, man. It feels very good right now. But we still have to allocate to our crypto portfolio at these prices. This isn't a, we're not at a point yet where it's like, oh, it's time for me to take the, the my foot off the gas. You know, it's no, you still need to be on point right now. But Maddie, it's very important here. We're not like giving the message to the team here that you need to be in over your head right now. You know, I see many people that look at this opportunity and they, they see this opportunity, but they jump like 10 toes in and start, you know, reaching into their savings, their kids' college funds. And if you are in that predicament right now, you are taking the wrong steps, right? You That might be steps you could have taken, like maybe take some of those funds out of your savings and DCA in the bear market. But if you're doing that right now, you are probably on a big hype train of what you've seen online with, you know, Bitcoin about to be going and uh, for higher prices here. And then once you get into that mindset, Matt, people just, they pigeonhole themselves and they get into time frames and they're like, okay, I'm going to allocate this into the market right now and I'll expect profits by the end of this year, right? And when you get into that moment, Matt, it gets very scary for you. Is that right? Yeah. So one of the things that we talk about in the consistent investor strategy, and it's the first thing that we talk about, and it's the thing I probably hammer on the most, is setting a budget for yourself and ensuring that that budget is not pulling from other, you know, income revenue streams or you know, pulling from areas of your life that are required to, you know, ensure that you have a comfortable life, right? And that means not pulling from your emergency savings. That means, you know, making sure that there's your investment monies that are meant for high volatility, high risk investments. Now, again, high risk doesn't mean that I think these are going to zero, but there's a lot of volatility and like you said, we can't promise timelines. We can't promise ourselves it's all going to happen by this day, by this time. As we've seen, there's so many exterior forces that can wreck your timelines and we don't want that to happen to us, right? So step one just involves with no matter where you are in the market, still setting a budget for yourself and sticking with that budget. And guess what? If you say this time around, I only got six months or eight months or nine months to engage in the bull run and I wish I had done it the whole time, right? That's okay. You can still take that mindset, but take it into this next bear market with you and go, okay, man, I didn't do it great this time, but I'm not going to deviate from a, a budget that is good for me just to overcompensate for my lack of involvement previously. Just be okay with the amount of time and the opportunity that's in front of you. Invest what you can genuinely afford to invest in high volatility assets, and then refocus up in this next bear market, right? Be excited about the bear market. Be excited about having that time after this next bull run to reaccumulate, all right? Maddie, that's some real wisdom right there. And I hope you guys take that to heart and act upon it. You know, and if you are just getting into the market right now, you need to be more strategic than ever. All right. And that's why you need to be a part of Crypto Charge team. We are from Crypto Charge, CryptoCharge.com. You can join us over there on the platform, shows, tools, etc. We got the community in Discord where you can I peeped this morning and we saw our boy Dan Habib. He told me last week, he's like, I'm gonna see Powell this what was it this weekend? Was it today, Matt? What That's today, our... yeah. He's out there shaking hands with Powell today. 
Yep, and we've been, you know, Dan is the macro guy, and so he's been critical of Powell, and, you know, it's just funny seeing a picture of them two together, and that is our home base guy. Dan is our home base crypto charge guy. So, team, if you need to be in a community, if you need crypto insights, if you need macro insights, you know, we make, when we talk about, you know, things that are going on right now, we'll get into it in a second with just the macro environment, it is being primed for good crypto prices. It's, it's priming us for the ability to see higher asset prices, risk on asset prices. And so we talk about that all over their team. So become a member, click the in the pin link. There's a link, you could take it directly to our site, sign up there, use code YouTube and do a free trial there and join us and become wicked smart. But let's get into it, Maddie. And I just wanna kick this off with a question for you because we started this episode off just talking briefly about you know the mindset things but let's get into where we are currently at right now i feel like we start we start the show a lot with this but we're in a very interesting moment right now i don't feel like if we were in this moment we'd be talking about like asset purchasing right now but a lot of these things comes down to mindset you must control your emotions right now and if you're not controlling your emotions you will do stupid things so maddie let's identify where we're at right now let's talk about you know just about overall bitcoin crypto right now the Bitcoin FUD is pretty much over. Mt. Gox and Germany selling Bitcoin, that's all over. Everyone, that's, you know, that's been wiped away this past week. Nobody's talking about it anymore. And equities are ramping higher. And, you know, we got Fed members like Austin Goolsby and Mary Daly basically signaling that we're going to see Fed rate cuts on September 18th, potentially maybe on July 31st, but not very likely. Maddie, oh, and also too, I had this written down here, spot ETS pending for, you know, could be launched any day now. So we have all these things stacking up here, Matt. Are we on the brink of the bull run? I mean, it sure feels like it, doesn't it? Um, you know, we have a lot of the signs coming together here. And again, you know, it's it almost feels like this literary cheat sometimes when we get to these moments in history, because, you know, you look at all the manipulation that happens in the market, you look at all the craziness in the bear market. And then, you know, as we get into this election season, which we talked about a lot, um, you know, we've been in this aggressive QT model uh, for the last two years, essentially, that might be coming to an end with some of the uh, data that we've gotten with inflation coming down. One of the big components of there being the shelter component that coming down quite significantly, you know, jobs reports not looking as, as good as they're supposed to, right? So we might be getting those cuts in conjunction um, with an election season. So, you know, it, it really does feel uh, sometimes we're like we're living a little bit of a simulation, but nonetheless, you know, you had the S&P and the NASDAQ both strike their 1.618 extension. So that's going from the macro crash instructions there and they're teetering with them right now, guys. So both of them are just teetering and within price discovery at these 1.618. We also had the Dow Jones breakout again today, new all time highs. We had a beautiful flagging structure we've been tracking on all the daily charts here, as well as the two and three day charts. Um, break of that that flag structure. We're working our way up. I do think that we're going to be working our way towards the 1.618 on the Dow Jones as well. And then you also kind of have this you know, recovery in crypto. So we actually saw all coins over the last several days, including over the weekend. Zcash, first of all, big winner over yeah. the weekend. Glad to see that. Um, but we're seeing really, really nice recovery with XRP, with Zcash and a variety of altcoins from pivot zones. So reclaiming moving averages, reclaiming pivot zones. So this is why, you know, especially with our top down analysis, we never just look at the crypto market. Of course, it's a big part of what we do, but having a full picture of what's happening with the dollar, with the equity markets, with the metal markets, it helps us better understand the health of risk on as a whole. So right now, obviously I'm feeling very bullish. I think it looks absolutely excellent. I'm being very tactical with what I had to. One thing I told my team is that I moved down from my just blanket DCA down to a very concentrated DCA over the last several weeks here uh, to capitalize on some of those things. Cash being one of them, you guys can go back and watch the streams. That's one of the things I was very, very bullish on. So I think the markets look good right now. Now, again, does this mean straight up parabolic season today, tomorrow, and forever? No. But are we seeing good signs of higher highs and higher lows being established? 100%. I love the way it looks. Let's get into some news pieces here. Sweden's central bank tests Algorand and Hedera for revolutionary e krona digital currency. The Rix Bank research highlights the environmental efficiency of Algorand and Hedera. Pay close attention here, team, because these are assets you care about. With Hedera's semi-centralized design and Algorand's decentralized model, both offering low energy consumption, high transaction throughput, balancing speed, security, sustainability. This was in a document. I'll show you it right here. Of potential climate impact of retail CBDC models. And so if a bank in Sweden, the bank of Sweden, the central bank of Sweden is researching this right now. And we're talking about blockchain models like Hedera and Algorand. These are things we talk about, Matt, when we talk about the sectors we care most about. When we're talking about assets like XRP, XLM, Algorand, HBAR, these are 
these are so revolutionary for us. And I just want to paint a picture here because we're discussing CBDCs here. And so I pulled up this little, this little map here. This is a central bank digital currency tracker. And as we can see, little two countries right here that got canceled, but just launched here. We're looking at countries like Nigeria, the Bahamas, Jamaica. And then when we add pilot testing right now, we're looking at 36 more countries involved here. In development stages, we're looking at half the world or more than half the world. We're talking like 70, 80 percent right now. And then we have our meager countries that are doing their research, a.k.a. just watching what these other countries do and where they take it. So, Maddie, we're on the brink of something special here when it comes to CBDCs. And, you know, it's a big hot topic right now because we're in a election season. And so my question to you is, is are these blockchains ready for running a centralized digital bank, digital currency, a CBDC? Botch that there, but sorry, you know That's what I'm saying. Right. You guys got the gist of it there. Um, do I think that we're ready for full implementation? No, I think there's a lot more testing that needs to go on. Um, now we have seen over the last several years, and this is news we actually covered pretty heavily through the bear market, was there was a ton of piling of not just one ecosystem, but many ecosystems all around the world of a lot of different blockchains and a lot of other just DLT solutions, not just blockchain solutions. Um, and you know, some of them are are actually moving into second phase uh, testing, you know, beyond just some of that pilot testing. So it's definitely something that is coming. Um, you know, I think a lot of people look at CBDCs and they go, no, this is the opposite of what we wanted. We wanted sovereign money. Guys, if you want, you can't have it both, right? You can't have like decentralized sovereign money, but then also have this like incredible high level of adoption. You can't unfortunately have both. They're not synonymous. Um, you know, when you try to look in, in history about the last times we tried to remove power from central authorities from our banking system, that was actually Executive Order 11110 uh, by JFK. Uh, actually, interestingly enough that we we're just talking about, you know, people getting assassinated. Uh, but that was the last time, guys, that we actually tried to remove power from centralized authorities when it comes to the printing of money, treasuries, you know, and, and overall the way the banking system works. So do you guys think that they're going to let us run around with this digital ecosystem that's incredibly valuable with technology that's highly valuable and then not also have some sort of central banking system that revolves around it. I, I just cannot envision a future where that does not happen. So, you know, you kind of have to remove your emotion from the sovereignty of digital currency from the future of DLT as a whole. Um, you know, as, as a libertarian, someone who cares very much about sovereignty and, and the ability to send money without an intermediary, like I love that we have Bitcoin, I love that we have all these things, but they're going to be constantly looking for more control, looking to reduce costs and of course that environmental footprint um, bitcoin has a very very nasty environmental footprint compared to other dlt solutions that don't require the proof of work model so that is something to consider moving forward when we talk about adoption as a whole so cbdc's are coming like it or not um you know it, it takes a lot to, again to remove that centralized force from any sort of ecosystem that's going to be moving billions if not trillions of dollars around the world Maddie, you just said CBDCs are inevitable, and that's what Correct. it looks like right now with all these pilot testing going all around the globe right now. But is it necessary for blockchain tech to be involved? I believe so. Um, you know, you look at the existing legacy system now and, you know, we have a fine, you know, version of accounting for now and, you know, balancing ledgers. But you look at the process that is already become a lot better when it comes to online banking, being able to do things without going into the bank. That was a very big step for us as a, you know, a worldwide economy. Um, but what is really going to elevate us is having a 24 seven economy, right? Never having to shut down, never having to wait until the bank opens to make a transaction. Um, you know, I, I do believe that we do have that need now now for a 24-7 market. That's going to increase liquidity. It's going to you know, increase security. It's going to uh, increase availability of banking for those who are unbanked around the world. I think it's absolutely necessary. And now that we have you know, over a decade now of, of study of this technology, and again, evolution of that technology, even just in the 10-year span, which is a very short span. Again, I implore you to pick any time in the last two decades, right? And, and look at the evolution of technology. It's very, very fast, right? So I think the next 10 years of evolution of, of DLT is really going to blow our minds. And, you know, some of us are going to be sitting here talking about, I remember the good old days when Bitcoin was the best thing out there, right? And now you've got all these crazy wallets that are doing things behind the scenes. And, you know, the user interface is really excellent. That's again, right now, guys, user interface is unusable for 95% of the population. They, they just won't do it if it's too, if it takes too many steps, if it's too complicated, if that's a tutorial, they're just not going to do it. So, you know, I, I think that we have a long ways to go, but I think that it's absolutely necessary. And I, I think that it's here to stay. All right, Maddie. So you just kind of laid out your case. I'm glad we laid it out this way because you just kind of laid out your case for a CBDC. But now we're going to take the contrarian approach to it and get some some thoughts here. Bitcoin miners at Donald Trump's closed door event 
say he thinks Bitcoin can help win the AI arms race. So former President Donald Trump held a meeting last week on Tuesday before, you know, this crazy weekend we saw with Bitcoin mining executives at Mar-a-Lago discussing the role of Bitcoin in America's energy strategy and potential for job creation. And Trump later that night said, Bitcoin mining may be our last line of defense against the CBDC. He went on later and said Biden's hatred for uh, Biden's hatred of Bitcoin, excuse me, only helps China and Russia and the radical communist left. We want all the remaining Bitcoin to be made in the USA. It will help us be dominant. Maddie, this is just so hilarious of the flip we've seen. So it was like anti-Bitcoin. But now it's made in the USA, minted or, you know, mined in the USA. So, Maddie, the question here is, you know, I'm, I'm so eager for a response to this. Is Trump right for being against a CBDC? I mean, deep down, I don't want a CBDC. So I... I definitely share the sentiment. Um, I, I don't think that he actually feels that way, if I'm being honest. I, I think that, you know, it's more of just a, uh, hey, my opponent really, really hates crypto. So I'm going to be as pro crypto as I possibly can be here. Um, obviously, you know, Bitcoin isn't made, right? Like it's, you know, we we shell it out in rewards based on the, the having, uh, having schedule, but it's not made. Um, so, you know, you, you know, never know the difference between a American made Bitcoin and a Russian made Bitcoin. Russia is responsible for a big portion of Bitcoin mining as a whole. First of all, the climate is excellent for Bitcoin mining, um, considering it's incredibly cold most of the year over in Russia. So they actually have a huge, you know, environmental advantage when it comes to mining. Um, you know, so I, I think that a CBDC definitely is going to take away some of the decentralization that we hold very near dear to our hearts here in the space right now. Um, but it's just a necessary evil in order to, you know, usher in more liquidity to have stable coins that people can trust. Right? Um, we have only had a couple of years pass since we had one of the larger stable coins that had a very large market cap collapse, and of course it was algorithmically pegged. Um, we've even had some small depeggings in, in Tether and USDC. Now they've been very short. They've been very brief. A lot of these are based on, you know, coordinated attacks to bring down, you know, the value temporarily. And again, some of these are just exchange-based values. You can always redeem the one for one. But we have a lot to flesh out. And I hate to say it, a CBD. CDC is going to create these, you know, uh, reserve requirements, um, as well as, you know, instill a little bit of trust in the public when it comes to something as basic as stable coins. So once you have kind of this public trust behind stable coins and stable coins equals the same as your dollars or your euros or your yen, now we can start to put more trust into the other parts of the ecosystem when it comes to oracles and payment plays and, you know, track and trace and all these other things. Uh, but I think it all starts with stable coin regulations. And unfortunately, the best and fastest way to do that, CBDC backed stable coins. All right, Maddie. So here's the grandiose question. This question will kind of encapsulate everything we've talked about here. What would be more helpful to the crypto market? a U.S. CBDC or a pro-crypto U.S. president? Well, we always have to remember, guys, that the president only represents one portion of our you know, lawmaking process, right? So even if a, a single individual or president is incredibly bullish on a very big idea, you still need Congress to, to be behind that, right? So you, it does require two parts here. So I'm going to actually say that probably a U.S. CBDC would propel the space forward faster than a singular president who is pro-crypto, no matter how pro-crypto they are. Because mm -hmm. again, this also comes down to regulation in the space. It legitimizes the the space that would legitimize the space far faster than someone who's just very bullish or very pro uh, Bitcoin or DLT or, or blockchain or you know whatever you know subset of words we want to use there. No, Matty, you thought very critically about that. That was very good. I thought that would you know because it is like you know if you're a normie, you'll say pro, you'll say uh, oh pro crypto president, you know. But we have to get through some layers there and dive a little mm -hmm. bit deeper and really look at what that means. But you've made the argument for a long time, Matty, about a CBDC and what that would look like in America. And I tend to agree, even though like as I go on, you know, I'm really having to munch on the CBDC conversation more and more because it kind of stems there for people before they even get to crypto. It's this idea of this digital dollar, even though they, you know, I mean, let me put a perspective for you, right? My grandparents, I had to teach them last year how to use their own banking app. Like they were a person right. that would go to the deal with the bank. They would literally drive to the bank to pull money out, you know, and so they are from that era, you know, and so when giving them like a banking app, it kind of changes their world and it takes a lot of time to get used to Bank of America app along with Zelle and 
moving right. money around. And so there is that whole generation that has to adapt to that, you know, and then they hear, you know, they turn on their news station and then they hear about CBDC and they think about control. Right. And that and that scares them. That scares them. And Maddie, you kind of led a, led me on this path of really understanding my grandparents here because I was just telling you about, you know, these my grandparents and how they could never understand my generation, you know, but right. you gave me perspective about the era in which they came from. And so when I talk to him about the era he came from, it makes a lot of sense, you know, dirt poor, struggling, didn't trust anyone, you know, and so it makes a lot of sense. So we're looking at where this goes from here, Matt. The, we don't know where this road leads for us, right? But all I know is like, you know, either a CBDC or a co pro crypto president is kind of towards the direction of what we want, right? This is a direction that we, I'm pretty excited about because it's, there's nothing standing in the face no longer of people at the front, like talking down to Bitcoin, unless you're, you know, not JP Morgan, but, you know, Jamie Dimon, you know, <laughs> Jamie Dimon's the only one, but you see Larry Fink this morning, you know, CEO of BlackRock, you know, big upping Bitcoin. So it's like, you know, all these big billionaires and CEOs of big companies and like all these people are now pro Bitcoin and pro crypto. And now when we look at, you know, the political race here, we got politicians, JFK and Donald Trump, and then, you know, Biden picking up the scraps on what he needs to say about crypto and Bitcoin. And so like we have everything leading in this direction right now. And now all stars align to a bull run here soon, Maddie. So I'm very excited, team. Don't miss out. That is all we have for today. If you got something valuable here, make sure you leave a like. The Ask Maddie show will be this Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific. We will see you then. So bye, team.